Hey everybody, this is Josh McKinney, and I want to welcome you to another exciting episode of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu Show. Now today, I have an interview for you guys. I interview a guy by the name of Alex Mazuka. And I know you may be like, oh, I don't know who that is. Is he a world champion black belt? Is he a coach of people? Or maybe you do know who that is. Maybe you're saying, hey, is that Mr. Build It on YouTube? I didn't know he does jujitsu. Well, I didn't know he does jujitsu either. Uh, if you guys are DIY type people and you like building stuff at your house, uh, Alex is really, really growing on YouTube in that sense, in the, the, the DIY, uh, and he does, he does some other stuff. He does some reviews of products and stuff like that, but really, really big for uh, home renovation stuff. He pretty much uh, on his YouTube channel, redoes parts of his house or, or builds uh, desks for parts of his house or build, builds a lot of different things. And he's somebody I followed on YouTube for a very long time. As you guys know, I talk about on the show, uh, my two other hobbies other than jujitsu are uh, DIY type stuff and cook. And so that's pretty much how I've learned all of those things is through YouTube. And one day, three weeks ago, I was watching a YouTube video. I was watching one of Alex's videos on a Sunday morning and he was doing some, uh, I forget what, I think he was doing some shelving in his kitchen and, uh, or he was redoing his pantry and he bought some plywood. He's driving home. He's talking about how it's going to rain. He's like, crap, it's about to rain. I'm going to, you know, this plywood's going to get ruined. Well, he gets the plywood into his garage and he takes a video of how hard it is raining. And I can see his truck on the video and I can see a small circular uh, uh, sticker. And it's a circle with a triangle in the middle. Immediately, if you guys, if you guys know any jujitsu patch besides apparently my gems, is a circle and it's got a triangle. You know, you see that uh, usually the the uh, uh, Gracie lineage usually follows that uh, triangle is like a, a really strong symbol, and so that is why they do that. But anyway, um, he. Uh, he, he has that video. I was like, I bet you that that is a jujitsu sticker. And so after a little bit of Instagram stalking, I find out that he got his blue belt, I think like somewhere like six to eight months ago. And uh, I was like, oh man, I gotta get this guy on the show. Uh, he, see, I was, I would, he seems like a really cool guy on YouTube. And I'm like, I bet he would be really fun to interview on the show. And he absolutely did not disappoint. Uh, this is just a really cool episode. Immediately, as soon as we get into the episode, he starts asking jujitsu questions because he is the type of guy that definitely is a good learner. And uh, we start talking jujitsu, we talk YouTube, we talk uh, a lot of other different things. But uh, just overall, as a guy, I think you guys are really going to like him. I think you guys are really going to love this episode. I know I really liked recording this episode. It was a really fun episode because it's very, very conversational. It, um, he, he's a really good speaker. And so it wasn't, um, you know, not that we have many interviews that are like that, where it's just question and answer. Uh, most interviews are pretty conversational, but I think this one, maybe even a little more, something that does happen on this episode is I am doing some home renovation things in my office right now. I'm actually redoing my office uh, so I can better, uh, I guess, I guess look to you guys. I could look better to you guys for uh, the YouTube channel on the show when I'm doing any of the solo cast type stuff uh, and any of the interviews, but I kind of screwed some stuff up and I had to move my Wi-Fi uh, router and I ended up not realizing why I kept losing Alex during this episode. You actually won't notice it except for one time. Um, and the reason I didn't trim it on that one time was because uh, we just kind of jumped right back into talking. And so I clipped it. You guys will know that uh, you guys will know what's going on um, with it when there's a five second pause in the episode. Uh, but before we get into the episode, just wanted to let you guys know, as I have been telling you the last few weeks, simplifyingjujutsu.com, we are giving away the ebook that I wrote for Simplifying Jujutsu named Simplifying Jujutsu. It is a 30 minute read, it is absolutely free, and 
it makes you better at being able to train jujitsu, not from a technique standpoint, but from an actual training method standpoint. That's something that is just not addressed very much in the jujitsu world. Every DVD is a how to uh, with a certain technique. Uh, what you're doing wrong in a technique or what you're doing right, which you could do better. But this is actually how to learn, how to train and how to get better at jujitsu. We go into a few things that we actually talk about on the podcast, uh, like positional stacking. And um, we talk some about the end goal method. We just talk about the five essential positions of Brazilian jujitsu. Like I said, that is absolutely free at simplifyingjujitsu.com. I will link it in the description of whatever you are um partaking in this show on and uh that is as always our only sponsor on the show because we really want you guys to get in on the simplifying jujitsu.com and the ebook that is absolutely free be sure to get it get your copy let me know if you guys like it and without further ado here is the episode you know you can Alex, how are you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? I am doing great. I saw today you got some training in. Saw on your Instagram. Got it in, man. Got it in. I didn't stay for too long, but I got it in. I got a, I got a message from uh, one of the guys that works for me here. Uh, he took my truck to run some errands, and uh, he clipped somebody. So I was two rolls in, and I was like, all right, I got to leave. Man, that's when you just don't answer your phone. Do you know what sucks, dude? It messes with your mind. Like, to, like, like you're uh, with me when I roll. Like, I gotta get in a proper frame of mind. And if I'm thinking about something else, man, like I can't let go of that. All of a sudden, I'm not controlling my breathing. I'm just, just holding one breath, missed every move. But yeah, I don't know if I should have checked my phone. Dude, I I get it. That's one. Of, that's a hard thing about uh, uh, about training when you use it to escape from things. There are some things you can't escape from. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a. Uh, it's. How much of it would you say it's mental? Um, I, okay. So it depends on who it is because, okay. um, if it's me, it's, you know, it's very, very mental for me. Uh, but I have guys that are, you know, that have wrestled their whole lives are great athletes and it's almost not mental at all for them. It is all physical. It is, they're just there. If you tell that they're a coachable person, if you tell them to do a thousand push ups, they won't ask why they'll just say, okay. Okay. Gotcha. 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 But does, does that go along with uh, like not getting gassed out as well? Man, it just, it just depends on the person. For me, the big thing I always say for not getting gassed, it's pacing. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause like we, we always talk about breathing and like, yeah, you're going to be tired if you don't breathe, but you can breathe really well and still get beat down. That's and so I think it's really important to, you know, when you're, when you're going into training to think about the pace that you're going with each time, because I don't keep a constant pace. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times that I'm training and I'm like not doing anything. My pace is zero. You know, I'm just holding, I'm waiting for you to make a move. There are times that my pace is, I, I just, I got home from the gym 24 minutes ago. My last round today was with one of my ultra heavyweights. We started standing. He's wrestled his whole life. There was no pacing. I was mm -hmm. gassed, right? There's nothing I could do about it, except for just get taken down. And, but I was trying, he's getting ready to compete. So I was okay. just, just taking the beating that I needed to. Uh, but uh, with him, I can't really pace, right? But with most guys, I'm trying to go and then wait, go and then wait. And in those pauses, it's like so much good jujitsu happens when nothing is happening. You know, like the there's so much strategy because I'm waiting. I'm like, okay, he's got two things that he could do here. Mm -hmm. What is he going? Oh, he's going for one. I know how to beat that. And then you take your next step. And that's where that, that idea that it's like human chess comes from, you know? Interesting. It was uh, it was, so to me, I, I define a successful day in training as a, I'm, I'm a, I'm very much a very beginner blue belt, right? I got my blue belt last uh, winter, I think uh, January. And, um, and, and it's to me, a successful day of training or grappling is never really whether I tapped or not. I don't care about that. I try to be a good student, but it's more of like, did I last the most amount of rounds that I could? Did I grapple with as many guys as I could without going, 
hey, I'm done. I got to use work as an excuse. Like I got to split like that. <laughs> And, and that's, that's to me is a very successful day. And uh, today was a prime example where I, I came in with another blue belt and he was trying to gas me out right away. I, I found myself to being a little bit more technical, but I kept trying to match his energy. And then next thing I know, cool. I submitted him, but multiple times, but I'm exhausted. Like I'm done. Huh? And so to me, to me, I feel like it was a failure of a day because now I'm thinking about my truck and my employee and all this stuff. And I'm like, and now I'm winded because I grappled with only two guys and I have to go home already. Like it, it's a, that's when I feel failure in those days. So next time you're training, try, try to pause in the middle of rounds, just mm. in just two seconds, three seconds. You'll, you will not, you will be so surprised with how little you do that. Cause we're trying to breathe. We're trying to keep constant, but you don't want that constant pace most of the time because mm -hmm. that constant pace uh, there are times that going fast makes more sense, but a lot of times sitting and waiting and just seeing jujitsu happen is one of like, uh, it, it's one of the best ways to, to progress, to get good. Um, because you're seeing what's happening. You're seeing what's happening around you. And then you can make the actual mental decision of I should respond like this, you know? Oh, interesting. What's your response to those guys that are gassing it and you're trying to watch and wait? Are you just trying to just find the easiest places of that invisible to just to rest or what are you doing? I, for most of the time, it depends on what position we're in, right? Because if I am in um, a position that I'm familiar with, maybe uh, there's something we call it. It's, it's, a, it's a knee cut position. We, we call it the staple. You keep your knee uh, centered on their chest. People will fight so hard in that position and I'm using all my body weight. I'm just sitting right. And I'm waiting for them to create an angle for me to pass. But if they're flailing and they're bucking, I'm just thinking, man, in two minutes, this guy is going to be in so much trouble because he's going to be so tired and I'm laying on him, right? Uh, I'm keeping that constant connection. So you'll find uh, the more you're thinking of it. Uh, so my dad trains too. My dad's also a black belt and he always uses the term we're playing a video game and we both have energy bars. And he said, and at that top, he says, you know, he, and he's 60, you know, and he's still rolling. And he's like, man, at the top though, you know, I, I start way down on the energy by being 60. He goes, but every time you move, you start getting closer and closer to me. And so he said, that's all I'm thinking about most of the round instead of like, I can finish. Right. Uh, and, and obviously it depends on what you're training jujitsu for, but I would say, I would argue that whether you're training for self-defense or for competition, you know, in competition, yes, it's great if you can finish your guy in 30 seconds. Right. Uh, but it's also great if you don't use any energy, you go your whole five, 10 minute match and you win, right? And you kept, you didn't use, you didn't waste any energy because you're going to be ready for the next round. If you're in a fight, it's the same thing. In a fight, the cardio level is, is 30 seconds. If you can just hold somebody for 30 seconds, they will be so tired that your ability to finish or, or to, to do whatever, or leave, escape if you need to, it's, it's on a different level. Hmm. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So what got you into jujitsu? Why'd you start? Oh, man. Uh, so I, I think everybody, for the most of the people that I know, they got into it through Rogan, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, with me, it was a little bit different. My tattoo artist, uh, he's the first person to start telling me about jujitsu. And then I didn't know what I, the, the idea behind it was at all. So I just kind of dismissed it. And I said, maybe one day, I'm a dad, right? So I was like, maybe one day when I get the snot beaten out of me, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take on, on a martial arts. And then he goes, I don't know, man. I've seen plenty of guys' heads bounce off the <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. And then uh, he put on a few podcasts, and that's Rogan. And then that's when I started listening a little bit more and more and more, a little bit of Jocko, a little bit of everybody else. And all of a sudden, they're all talking about the benefits of it. And then I just started embracing the mindset. This is a couple of years ago, but I just started embracing the mindset of just doing difficult things, right? When you put yourself in a situations where you get to exercise very difficult things that when real life events happen, you've kind of already trained to be uncomfortable, uh, and uh, that's when I was like, you know what? I remember what that guy was telling me about jujitsu. I'm gonna let me see what his school's all about. And that's when we I walked into uh, Gracie T, uh, Team Rhino and uh, kind of kind of started that that path from there. How long have you been training for? Been training for a year and a half, almost two years. So it took me about a year and a half, a year. It took me a solid year to get my 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 blue belt. And your oldest son trains too, correct? Well, my oldest and now uh, my middle son. So I have three kids. My youngest daughter, she is two months old now. And then my two sons, uh, Jack is seven 
and Beckham uh, is five. And so Beckham just started. So Jack's been doing it for, for as long as I have. And then now Beckham just started up. How are the in-home wrestling matches? They're fun, man. They're, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 I always forget that if, if you try to invest in your kids, they always want to do whatever you're doing. doesn't matter what it is. And so I'll find my boy who's always trying to grapple with me. And now that Beckham started, it's like last night was a prime example. And you follow me on social media. So you like these stories where they're like, all of a sudden Beckham to my, my oldest son, Jack's like, hey, let's grapple. And they'll just slap him bump and go after it. But I don't know. It's, it's super cute, man. It's like it's all of a sudden it's something that you're, you know, entertained by, I guess. And it's, it's interesting, too, because people will think that boys wrestling is this bad thing. It's this right. ill-willed thing. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, anybody listening that listening to this podcast probably trains. And the guys that train, they recognize, like, man, those are my closest friends. And yeah. it's the same with family, too. Yeah. Uh, I, my dad and I started at the same time. Right. And he was um, – he and I, like, that was – well, we were always close, but that was what really brought us close together because we would fight each other every day. Yeah, yeah. You know what's interesting about that is uh, about the unity that happens between us is I, I think in the last couple of years as I got into that multiple kids stage of life, right? When you first have a kid, you, you're, not, you're not really a parent just because you can pass the kid. Do you have kids? No, no kids. Okay. So, so like with the first kid, it's you and your spouse. And when you get tired of the kid, you pass on to your wife and vice versa. And you kind of recalibrate when you have two kids, you both kind of have somebody, so you can't really escape. And then when you have a third kid, it's like, what was that one comedian said? Having a third kid is like when you're swimming and you have two kids and everything's on fire and then somebody throws you a third kid. Yeah. That's, I, I, for, I was literally going to quote the comedian. It was, I think it was Jim Gaffigan. Um, Browning. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's your third baby. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Louis C.K. Yes, that's who it is. That is and, uh, and it's truly, that's how what it is. And so I realized that my natural dynamic that I used to have before, where I used to go with my buddies once a week, once every two weeks, grab beers, blah, blah, blah. That's no longer existent because everybody's in a stage where like, we're trying to keep our head above water because the hardest thing is that every kid has something going on every single day, right? Like now to me, it's like this kid's class is this day, this kid's class is this day, then you got t-ball, then you got all this other stuff. And you're like, okay, we got to just limit it down a little bit. And so we realized this, my social life was just almost non-existent, not to mention my profession, I create content and I can't relate to any of my normal buddies who have office jobs. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is like now my deepest friendships are the guys that I walk into class in and we both kind of embrace that suck where we're both like, goofing off while trying to dominate one another and it's weird because i've never experienced something like that before that is really interesting and just uh almost shifting the conversation a little bit you said uh you you have trouble relating to your buddies with office jobs now because uh uh officially what was it like just a few months ago i saw on social media that it was your last day yep. as a respiratory, respiratory therapist what was yep. it respiratory therapist Okay. And so you're officially all YouTube now. Um, I'm sure yeah. other things, you know, I'm sure that it's not just, you know, there, yeah. there are a bunch of other layers, but uh, how do you find, do you, do you find that you've almost lost your group of friends that you had? Uh, yeah, yes and no, just because I have smaller um, communities of friends that we have a specialty of a, of a thing that unites us. For example, my non jujitsu friends, uh, one of the things that unites us is archery so uh, or hunting. And so, you know, every time fall comes around or some kind of spring shoot, that's what we're doing. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that really unites us. Uh, if it's my jiu-jitsu buddies, that's a year-round thing. If it's, uh, you know, um, friends that we really only hang out with when, you know, our spouses are hanging out, then that's when. So it's just, it's almost like a, it's a subject kind of base thing. You, you do find out that after a while, there's a, a fine definition between, you know, when you're younger, you're like, oh, this is my best friend, so-and-so. And then you get a little bit older and your life gets busy and you start realizing there's friends and then there's acquaintances. And you start realizing you have far more acquaintances than friends, you know? That is so true, man. So do yeah. you, um, in those, so I, I heard it, I heard you say it. I'm going to just speculate what you mean. Sure. You said our spouses are hanging out yeah. and then we're like forced to be together you have yeah. nothing in common right you know you know it he knows it it's yeah. not that you don't like yeah. each other yeah. but you're like yeah man yeah. you know you, you know, so how do you deal with that 
you know, okay, so I'll backtrack a little bit. Here's a prime example. We were just out. So my wife, she has a best friend. So I, okay, even before that, I used to consider myself to be a very extroverted person. And I think a lot of my YouTube co content and maybe even this kind of conversation here, I might come across a little bit as an extroverted person. You're like, hey, this guy gets charged up by being around people. And the reality is, is the more I started going into YouTube, the more you're like, have this non-traditional work schedule, you're working from home, you're, you're, you're your solo thing, apart from a couple employees that I have, like, you don't really have that much interaction with people that when you're, you're constantly turning your energy level on, you, by the time it's done, you have zero energy for anybody else, but your family, right? You're like, I, they, like, if my, we're talking about energy bars, like we do in first full circle, like it's decreased and I don't, I can't. And so what ends up happening, you, you almost become antisocial. I almost tell my wife, like, I don't like people now. Like, it's as weird as it sounds. Like, I, 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 I like to create content and I like to being around other people who create content. So a person like yourself, yes, jujitsu probably, if we met in person, is something that really kind of gets excited about. But at the same time, I feel like what I would relate to you more on is the passion of creating content and putting it out for the world. And then kind of allowing your brain to kind of figure out what you want to do. How do you want to grow it? Where do you see that leading into? That's what excites me. So when I'm put in positions like this last couple of days, my wife, her best friend, and you know, they, they did a dinner thing. And her, her husband is great. Me and him hung out plenty of, plenty of times. But he's not a guy that I would call because we have nothing in common. He doesn't do jiu-jitsu. He doesn't shoot. He doesn't hunt. He, you know, I, he, he's not like, I wouldn't, I don't use the wrong terminology like he's not as involved with his kids like I like to get my kids and go deer biking and all that stuff and so I to me we're just being nice we're just trying to survive at that moment and mm -hmm. it's not that I'm I'm loathing it it's just that it's not my first choice I'd rather be at home watching the UFC fight drinking bourbon by myself <laughs> <laughs> dude that is it's so it's so tough to to get that across that um how when you have a job that um because it's for me content creation is not my source of, I, it's one of my source of income, not in the sense of the podcast right now. Um, sure. but we have a jujitsu production company. So we're doing a lot with that. But the main thing is that I make money on is teaching and mm -hmm. showing up, greeting everybody, even though it's my favorite thing to do in the world, to pat every guy on the back, ask them how, Hey, how's your knee? How's your yeah. wife? Yeah. How's your, you know, whatever. Um, how's your prison sentence going? You know, anything like that, you know, you, getting to do that is so much fun. But when I get home, even after an hour of it, the, uh, physically I'm still fine, right? Physically, I still feel great. Mentally, you are so drained. You're so fatigued from that. Uh, you know, that is, uh, I, I always, uh, you know, back to my dad on this, he's been a pastor of a church since I was a little kid. And he always had said that like, man, Mondays are the worst days in the world because he would preach twice on Sunday and he's like, Mondays are horrible. He's like, I, I can't, you know, I can't do anything. And I never understood it until like, you know, I taught a jujitsu seminar one time. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I need four days to recover from this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you get to, you get, to, I used to be a, a, an intern at a church way before when I was younger. And I remember it was one of those mega churches where there's like thousands of people for services. And I do remember after like a 10 hour internship, you go home and you feel like you got hit by a bus. Like you're, though you're, you're just, cause you're so in front of people. You're so like turn like you turn that energy level on and you're so invested in people that by that time, everything's done. You're like, I don't, I don't, I just want to be here and just lay and relax. And. Mm -hmm. and so now that you made that transition to just content creation, yep. what do you, do you find that you have more time or do you find that you are spending more time on that content, trying to make it better, trying to do yeah. more with it? Yeah, uh, man. So I, I, I would completely 100% answer that I have less time. Like before I used to balance working 12 hour shifts at the hospital. And then, um, and obviously slowly within the years, I was cutting my hours down to, it's not, you know, um, but, but it got to the point now that I was, I was feeding our, our daughter last night. And I was like, this is so strange. Like I have more time to create content now because I don't have this other thing to distract me. But the way I scale this thing in a way, like I feel like I have less time and my quality of life is decreasing, right? Like, cause the dream is always like working for yourself. The dream is to, to be self-sufficient, especially if you can just use the internet and not people, fantastic. But you start realizing that, and maybe it's like the whole, like you're trying to provide for your family that you feel like, okay, now it's pedal to the metal. Like we can't fail now. Um, but yeah, no, it's something that I was actually thinking about last night about I had to, 
I have to maybe redefine success for me and maybe figure out how to scale in a way where, because time is the most ultimate thing, right? Like it's not money, right? I don't believe money is the root of happiness. I think what money is, is it gives you opportunity and opportunities is what gives you happiness. And the opportunities for me to take off for a weekend or for four days with my kids and go do fun stuff with them, that is an opportunity that money was able to bring me. And I just got to get a little bit better about seizing those opportunities, you know, so. Do you have a set time of your content creation? Yeah, I do. I do. It's a little bit adjusted now with this whole newborn baby with the, the, the sleep schedule. But uh, I, I brought, okay, so I learned this lesson from one of my buddies who's a very successful photographer in Seattle. And uh, he said the downfalls are of, of his like own business is that he's always reachable. He's like, what I hate is like, I can never not answer an email. I'm always reachable. People can always get a hold of me. So technically there's no business hours. There's no office space. Like the jujitsu school that you go to, you're done and you leave. When you're working from home, he goes, that's the problem is you're always reachable. So what I made sure to do is when I finally went full time, um, or even before full time, when I just designated these days is if I work 12 days at the hospital, 12 hour days at the hospital, if it was, uh, you know, 7 a.m. PM, then 12 hours is what is categorized in my mind that if you can't accomplish whatever you want to accomplish in 12 hours, then what's another 30 minutes going to do nothing. You're not going to feel better. You're not going to feel more accomplished. So to make my own daily check mark to get a gold star for myself, I would say 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. 5 a.m. Uh, that way my kids are all still sleeping. I can handle start, whether it's computer stuff, whether it's getting supplies for the project, maybe planning the day, and then be done at 5 p.m. And because I work from home, and in fact, I'm sitting at a desk that I share with my wife because she has her own business. I have my own here. And my kids are always in and out. And, and so they're always saying, hey, can we do this? Can we do this other thing on a you know, Tuesday morning? They're not registering that a lot of their friends, their parents, they go to an office. So they, they don't see them, so they can't ask them those questions. With me, with us, I have to tell them, listen, because if I just say no, I just feel like a horrible parent and I feel like I'm failing. But I, my rule of thumb is this, we can do whatever you want to do, but we have to do it after 5 p.m. After five, dad's done. But in order for dad to feel accomplished, dad has to start at five. So five to five, those are my content hours. Is that what days? Is that every day? Every, Monday through Friday. Monday through okay. Friday, I tried to, because the hospital, one thing the hospital that I hated is that we had to work weekends every other weekend. And that's one thing that pushed me to start something like a side hustle, right? Because this all started from a side hustle. It was pushed because life was still happening on the weekends with my kids, right? They're not in school. So they get to do birthday parties and all these things. And I didn't want to miss out on those opportunities. So that's what made me start my, my, my content creation. And uh, I make it a hard, fast rule in my mind that Fridays are an easy day. Saturday, Sundays are no content days. It's just you're, you're, you're just being present. It's the days that you have cheat meals. It's the days that you, you know, you say yes more than you say no to your kids. And so that's what I kind of try to stick to. That's cool, man. How is the bathroom going? <laughs> it's good. I finally got the towel and the toilet in. So I just got to start the vanity. It sucks because uh, we're selling this house next month because I'm out of projects. And, uh, and so it's like, you're trying to button everything up and you're trying to also figure out, okay, once we sell it, we're probably not going to find a house for a few weeks to a month. And so you're, uh, it's, it's a little frustrating because I'm trying to figure out what to do and how to do the content part. If I was not to have a garage for a month or two, you know? So that was actually one of my questions for you was, yeah. When you run out of projects, if the people listening, if they don't know yeah, that yeah. you um, do a lot of um, DIY home renovation projects yeah. and uh, you know, that's how I connected with you. I always watch your content. Oh, cool. Uh, Thank you. Just a lot, I enjoy creative stuff and never had any idea you did jujitsu. And uh, it was, I was watching, so it was something with, you were doing with plywood. I don't remember what it was. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. I think it was uh, maybe kitchen pantry something yep. and yep. you are driving home you're like oh man plywood in my truck it's gonna get rained on i gotta get home and then you you pulled a picture up or a video up of your truck as the rain was hitting it mm -hmm. and you're like man look how much it's raining right now yeah and i was like that looks like a jujitsu sticker on the back of it mm -hmm. i mean all jujitsu stickers look the same yeah. they're a circle right. with a triangle right. in them yeah. i was like that's a jujitsu sticker and yeah. i looked on your instagram far enough i saw you your blue belt promotion i was yeah. like oh yeah. I got to get him on the podcast, but, um, you know, when you are, uh, 
um, you know, when you were done, that was my big question was, mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to do? Are you guys going to yeah. move to yeah. a new house? And in, in yeah. why is that kind of the plan? Yeah. So it's funny because this house, this is an interesting house because um, this house created my career and it started my wife's career. Right. So my wife, she, her degree is in education. And then she, the, the way she, when I remodeled, she, first of all, my wife cried when I tried buying this house. So she did not want it at all, but I had a vision. And this is before I started YouTube or anything like that. So finally convinced her, bought the house, started making these transformations. She started decorating it. Uh, my, I started seeing success on YouTube through, through renovating it. She started realizing about herself that she's got this knack for style and design that led to her starting her own, uh, interior design and staging business, not to mention becoming, you know, growing on social media. And that's what started my, my YouTube thing. And then three years into it, we're kind of done. So, um, turns out this is not going to be our long-term home. We're selling it next month. My goal I, again, I started realizing I don't like people more and more working around people. So I want to get away from it, especially how the media is right now with the world on fire and mm -hmm. you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask or whatever. So I just, I, I'm kind of romanticizing this idea of like getting like three acres of land and just kind of like being secluded somewhere. So I could, if I want to build a barn and lay some mats down, great. If I want to be able to put a, a pool, I could like, it's just, I, I, I'm getting crammed in the subdivision thing. So we're going to put it up for sale. Hopefully we'll get that and then uh, start the renovation project from scratch again. That's awesome, man. So you're in Boise, right? Yep. Boise, Idaho. Mm -hmm. All right. And so is that where you guys plan to stay? Oh yeah, for sure. I grew up in Seattle. My wife's from here. Um, I am an immigrant. So I, we moved from Russia to like the ghetto in Seattle and I thought it was fantastic. I didn't realize it wasn't until we grew up and I was like, Hey mom, did we, was I the only white kid where we lived? He's like, yeah, you were. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like you don't know where you lived until you like leave that place and go somewhere else. Dude, I, I am, I grew up in uh, one of, so our town, um, the worst country or worst city uh, in the country is East St. Louis. Oh, and wow. um, our town was butted up against East St. Louis. That's where I grew up. It was a very rough area. But I, in, in my mind, we were always rich. I had no idea. Yeah. 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 I had no idea. I was the only fat Asian kid in, <laughs> in Madison, Illinois, you know, and, uh, you know, no yeah. clue. When did you realize that? How old were you? And you realized you're like, Oh man, did we grow up poor? I, man, I had to be, I had to be like looking back on it. It was, it was more like even, so we moved out of that house. I think when I was like 19, um, I had actually started, no, 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 no. I would have been 21. I started my own jujitsu school. There was this place next door. I was engaged. I was getting ready to move out, but, uh, um, my parents decided to move into this place next door to our gym. Cause we have our jujitsu gym and my dad has a personal training business. And, uh, we moved out and I never really realized how bad the area we lived in until being out of it for a couple months and driving through it. And people were like, walking through the streets as I was driving and like I would stop and I was like wait what they're not supposed to be walking in the street you know there's you know like just in the middle of the street like that shouldn't happen and um just like in looking back like oh wait it's it's not normal for everyone to have a few yeah. drug dealers on their street it's not yeah. those things aren't normal and yeah. uh you know it's just like it was like a slow realization of like oh I get it now mm. Yeah, my wife is interesting because she was, uh, this area that she grew in, it's, first of all, I mean, the, what makes this place super safe is that between this place and Salt Lake City, it's a huge LDS community, a huge Mormon community, and it's, it's very moralistic, and we, we don't practice that faith or anything like that, but it's just like, you're here, you're surrounded by all your neighbors like that, and like, you hear breaking news, and I remember when I, well, here's a fun, here's a fun fact, so we did a little long distance relationship for like, I don't know, a couple of months. And I remember I decided to take a spontaneous trip up here in the middle of the night. And I pulled up to a gas station and in Seattle, in the middle of like, if you're at a gas station, 3am, you don't talk to anybody. You come in, you do your thing. You go, you know, you get in your car and you drive off. I walk in. First thing I hear, good morning. Like, it just startled me. And, uh, and to me, that's, that's what was a big shocker. Like people wave to you. You'll drive in the thing in a subdivision. You've never met them in somebody else's subdivision, they'll wave to you. And, and those little cultural shocks is what shocked me. Um, and so, you know, so if I see somebody in Seattle who's 
sniff, you sniffing, sniffing, you know, like, oh, okay, you've done a little uh, devil uh. dandruff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and my wife is like, oh, they have some, you know, runny, runny sinuses or, you mm-hmm. know, a deviated septum or something. I was like, no. So it's, it's just, I don't know. I'm thankful where I grew up with just because of the exposure that I have. But I, I'm kind of glad that my wife is a little naive and I'm glad my kids haven't been exposed to that world yet. So first time uh, my wife and I had been dating, we were young. We started dating. I may have been 17 at the time and we were at a red box uh, in the town that I grew up. And uh, you know, she didn't really grow up in a very nice area, but it just wasn't the level that it had been at. And somebody came up to us and was asking us for money. And like, I could tell as soon as it happened, as soon as we were approached, like, oh no, like Emily's never been asked for money before. She does not know like how to hand, she thinks we're getting robbed. Yeah. And you know, it's like a 75 year old lady. And like, I, I, babe, we're fine. It's not, it's not a big deal. And, you know, yeah. Talk to the lady a little bit and uh, you know, she, I probably gave her a, a few bucks and then she, she left and she was like, I was so nervous there. And I was like, oh, that doesn't happen to you usually. That's weird. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, so uh, just back in, while we're talking about significant others, bringing us back to jujitsu, mm-hmm. has your wife trained yet? She has not trained yet. Uh, she has not trained yet. And I made her not an ultimatum, but I, I, I told her this is like, hey, because we weren't finding out the sex of our third kid. Um, this is going to be our last and final kid. We had a high. We knew it was going to be another boy, but we really wanted a girl. And we did not find out until the baby was born. And I told her that if this is a girl, she has to do jujitsu. The girl does. And uh, and the rule of thumb is this is like all the I'll pay for all the kids jujitsu until the age of 18 Then they they can do whatever they want if they want to quit they can quit if they want it then they, um, But that was the rule and I also told my wife like you have to train jujitsu as well So I think once uh, everybody's done being breastfed and all that stuff then mom will uh, will have to get on the mat and figure out figure out uh, the humble beginnings Oh yeah, man. That's my, my wife didn't start training until after I was a black belt and we had yeah. been together. We got together when I was a blue belt and she just never was into it. Um, she tried it once or, or twice when I was a brown belt maybe and uh, ended up when I was a black belt, just deciding like uh, the story is I've told, I lied about the story at first, but this is the real story. I was at a jujitsu tournament and I was in the bullpen and this girl coming off the mat that I knew from whatever gave me a high five. My wife did not like that. She was like, Hey, I got to be able to beat this girl up. I have no, you know, I I don't, I, I know that she would kill me right now. I've got to be able to beat this girl up. And so she she was training Monday. She was training that Monday. That's hilarious. So, okay. So your dad is what is an, or was a pastor. Is that what he was? He still is. He's still, uh, yeah, still is a pastor. so, So, okay. And then, so he trains and then both of you are black belts. So how did that, how does that all happen? How did, so he was a pastor, started training, you got into it and started training and what happened? So, uh, at, story on the podcast. as, as I was saying, like earlier, I was a fat Asian kid, right? Yep. My yep. mom said, Hey, you need to do something. I went to a private school. It was super small. We had no sports. Um, she's like, you need to do something active. And I had done, um, Gracie basic videotape self-defense stuff, like just on the videotapes training in our garage. And we Uh did that when I was a little kid. And so there's always some interest there. And um, Matt Hughes opened up a gym like five minutes from our house. Mm -hmm. And so we started to talk like maybe, maybe that will be the place. Uh, I kind of, I didn't want to do it. I just didn't have a huge desire to do it. My mom made me go to my first class. I was 14. There was no kids class. It was only adults. And so I uh, talked to the coach and he was like, you know, he's like, you're, you're not a big 14 year old at all, but he's like, if you can handle it, you know, he's like, come in and try it. So I came in, it's uh, still my coach to this day. Uh, I started training and I just fell in love, man. I, I honestly, within six months, even at 14 years old, I knew like, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, my dad had trained a little before like for a few months um before a few years uh prior uh somewhere in our area and he started training with uh with me and uh, my dad was my coach's first black belt and i was a second and so we you know like we've been doing it 
for forever. For him, it was like, uh, people do ask the, you know, Hey, you're a pastor. How do you, how do you do jujitsu? And, um, for him, he's kind of like, man, I got to beat up people in the congregation. Sometimes you never know. Right. You know, you know, yeah, people we, are crazy. Yeah. We have a, we have a pastor that goes a blue belt as well. Pastor Bill, we call him. And yeah, man, he's a, he's a killer, man. It's cool. Like he's just coming in and yeah, it's awesome. He, we, we always joked that we would get shirts that said my pastor could beat up your pastor. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And so, yeah, it's just, um, it, it, you know, just one of those things, man, we just started training together. My dad was always a small business owner. So I knew like, I want to teach jujitsu in the future. And so it just kind of grew from that. And, uh, you know, started pretty young. I started when I was 21, started teaching and, uh, have been doing it ever since we moved, just moved to a bigger location. We, uh, uh, have like 150 people that we have. And so have a really good jujitsu school. Are you, so is this your school or have you partnered with somebody else to do this school? So this is just the school is, so my dad and I actually run our businesses under the same umbrella. Uh Um, and it allowed me to be an employee of his fitness business, even his fitness business called fitness and more. And so the and more part became jujitsu. It used to be massage. Uh, my mom used to do massage uh, when I was younger, but uh, uh, that became jujitsu. It allowed us to, um, you know, for me as a, uh, you know, as a young 20 whatever year old with very low credit to be able to get a loan for a house when I bought my first house. And uh, um, yes, yeah, so we've just, we just kind of run our businesses separate, but they are under the same umbrella. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It was actually interesting. We have a school out here. I just got my like uh, enhanced concealed license and uh, they, they kind of do the same thing. It's, it's, they have a like Krav Maga and then they also do like uh, gun tactical training courses and all that stuff. So those are smart things to just kind of put under one umbrella and just kind they, of operate. They really are, man. Yeah. That is uh that is huge for, uh, I think uh, we froze up again here. I don't know what we're, we're like losing each other here. Yeah. I don't know why it keeps, for some reason you keep becoming the host when like it'll pause. It'll. Oh, cool. You're the host. Yeah. So you're the, you take become the, the host of over. the show. All right. Take it over. Here we go. <laughs> Josh is out here, folks. Yeah. Here we go. Hey, this is Alex. Welcome to the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're, I'm a blue belt and like all blue belts do, they try to tell everybody else what to do. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, man. That's the best. I, I hated that. So our school has, uh, and I don't know exactly which schools do it, but our school has that transitional belt between like the white and the blue belt. There's like this green belt, right? Like a transitional belt. And I remember once I got my green belt, oh my goodness, how many, like every blue belt wanted to tell me how to live my life. <laughs> but every like purple, brown and black belt were like the coolest people in the world. They're just like, okay, you know, I just ask them, hey, you know, what should I have done differently? And they'll tell me, but every blue belt always wanted to like we would drill something and every blue belt would stop something in the middle of the drill and tell me a different way they would go in this drill that we both just learned Uh uh-huh yeah and and i hated that dude that's the uh it's it's just what happens it's the blue belt professor man oh it's so annoying i see that i see that all the time at my gym i don't even like i don't even acknowledge it like dude you Just, just go ahead. Just teach, oh. teach them whatever you want. Oh, uh, so that was my follow-up question. Well, like actually, for for, for a black belt as yourself or an instructor, it's like, how do you deal with these personalities that like they're good people, but they are just horrible students when it comes to just like getting on these social cues of like, like my professor. Uh, he was trying to. We were going over like the X guard, right, or whatever, and he was trying to show a transition from a single leg takedown into like the X guard. And so one of the students, he tells him, okay, hey, do a single leg takedown. His point was not to perfect the single leg takedown. His point was to go enter with a single leg takedown and then we'll, we'll, I'll show you the move after. And so he goes into it. And this one salt pepper guy, blue belt, which is always the worst combination when it's an older guy who's also blue belt, <laughs> tells the guy, the other student says, okay, now do it, do the single leg takedown properly. And my professor is like, and I'm sorry if I'm going to cuss, but my professor goes, Cause I don't fucking want him to do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and, and cause whose school is this? And, and, and obviously the, the guy responded fine. He goes, thank you for conditioning my mind, body and soul, whatever. But it's to me, I always think about it. I was like, man, could you imagine like all these, like, how do you guys handle these personalities that are just like 
they're bad with social cues about just like letting you do what you're doing here. Okay, so I handle it differently than a lot of places probably handle it. This is this is what I always say about the gym. My gym, my gym's name is Head Not HQ. Head Not HQ is a free market. Okay. It I do not, I do not try to, unless there is something morally speaking uh wrong that is happening, I don't mess with it because I have um, I have one black belt under me and then I have a few just monster brown belts, a few monster purple belts. They're all good dudes. And I just tell like, Hey, you guys rule. If you guys need to put a stop to something, if you guys feel like you need to handle something, you guys handle it. I'm not, I trust you guys enough to make that call. I just teach, you know, if you need my help, if you ever need something, um, and, and like, uh, we always, always call it like uh, being green lit. Like if somebody's, really annoying. You put the green light on them and you, you tell people, well, there was this one situation that always springs to mind when somebody asks like this or asked me a question like this. So we had this guy, um, he definitely had some type of, uh, something mentally just not there. He was definitely struggled. Well, one night, um, we'll call him Dave. His name wasn't Dave, but we'll call him Dave. Right. So one night, um, we're all done training and one of the guys said, hey, Dylan asked me to beat up Dave. And, he's, and I was like, well, did you do it? And he's like, well, yeah, of course. Why would Dylan ask me to do that? And I was like, okay, that, that was weird. And then one of the other guys goes, yeah, he asked me to do the same thing. And I was like, did you do it? He's like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, Dylan's our boy. You know, we would always help him. And oh, okay. Dylan had told multiple people. Dylan was injured at the time. He was just watching class. Dylan actually put on his gi and rolled that night. And I didn't think anything of it. Um, you know, he's an idiot. He'll roll through an injury. He doesn't care. And uh, I was like, man, that is so bizarre. Like, Dylan would never do that without cause. You know, he would never ask somebody to, uh, to, to, to beat somebody else up without cause. And so, like, I, like, I have no idea. Whatever, we grab our stuff, get in the car, start driving. And my wife was with me. And she goes, hey. I go, yeah. She goes, I know why Dylan had them beat up Dave. I go, why? She goes, Dave was like neck cranking me really hard when we were rolling. And, uh, and she's like, he was being really rough on me. And she's like, and I didn't care. I wasn't going to say anything. Um, and, uh, and she goes, and Dylan came up to me after and he said, Hey, he was going a little too hard. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's when I say my gym is the free market. It's the yeah. free market. I just, I let those things play out and, uh, you know, they seem to always be, they always seem to handle themselves. I, I really can't think of a single time that I've had to step in, uh, to anything like that, you know? Oh, that's interesting. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. It's such a strange thing. Cause I don't know, I don't know like the right or wrong answer because it's such an, like a non-traditional environment where we both, we all signed this disclosure to not sue anybody for injuries or not all this stuff like and so you come in into this controlled environment where both people say i'm gonna respect your tap i'm gonna respect you as a training partner but then yeah you have those people who have a little you know ego or a, a, a nut or bolt loose in their head a little bit in just the right environment and um i don't know it's like it's hard to control that ecosystem like and i don't know what's the right answer you know yeah, man, that's like, so I am able to get away with it because I have an awesome group of higher belts. And that okay. is like, you know, that is why I am, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to do that, do, mm -hmm. do it the way that I do. Um, mm -hmm. But like the, the level of leadership from my higher belts, it, it allows me to not have to do, uh, to not have to worry about anything but just running the gym, you know, mm -hmm. not have to worry about that, uh, the unspoken parts of jujitsu. And we're also... Um, not very traditional when it comes to this is my dog coming in. Like hey. I said, I'm usually not in the living room, but he's <laughs> excited that yeah. I am. this is Thor, and Thor. Uh, he's nice. always trying to say hi. Get out of the camera. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, you know, uh, we, we're a lot less traditional than most. I would I would assume, and so that probably would be part of it. But like, I think the big thing is everybody gets treated with a lot of respect, even the lower level belts, uh, from everybody. And I think that that really carries over. And so I always say like people that are douchebags, they just don't have, they're not a good fit, you know? And yeah. so they leave, you know, they yeah. just, 
they can recognize that, oh man, um, I don't fit in here. Everyone else is nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's, a, that's a great point because you're right. Some of the most skillful uh, practitioners were always the nicest people to me, you know, like there was always the, 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 you know, the, the purples and the brown belts that they were just like, you know, Hey man, just like, you're, you're always welcome. You know, this is awesome. And that's, man, that's like the cool thing about jujitsu is, um, is, is when people that could kill you treat you like, you know, like treat you so well. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So while, while I have you on so I can get uh, good husband awards, mm. you know, this is off topic of what we've been talking about, yeah. but my wife started a YouTube channel like last week. If you could give any piece of advice to somebody who just started a YouTube channel, hers is like a, like health lifestyle, like vlogging. Yeah. Vlogging. What okay. piece of advice would you give? Okay. So, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw a few things at her and this is probably to everybody. Um, the first one I'll answer with, uh, somebody once asked me what to see. So Casey and I, do you watch a lot of uh, vloggers or anything like that? Like Casey Neistat, Peter McKinnon, anybody like I that? watch no vloggers, no. No, okay. So there's these lot of guys that I really was a big fan of before I started YouTube. And uh, Casey Neistat, who is a monster in the vlogging world, who kind of, kind of paved the road, he did a thing about uh, 10,000 subscribers. And he said, the 10,000 subscribers are your most important and the most hardest to subscribers on YouTube to get because... Like once you hit 10,000, such a big deal. It's basically like 100,000 subscribers because nobody knows who you are before then. And now 10,000 is just this big pot of people who now can generate uh, traction to each one of your videos, right? So if of 10,000, you have 10% or 5% that watch your videos, that kind of adds to the algorithm to kind of keep promoting your stuff, especially if they engage. So the question is, is how do you get to 10,000 subscribers? So I met one guy, he had a sneaker side hustle thing. And he says, what's the secret to the first 10,000 that Casey was talking about? And I had no idea how to answer him until I finally clicked with me. I think the secret to the first 10,000 subscribers is obsession. Like you have to be so dead obsessed about being so discontent with whatever part of your financial life or your, your career that you already have or your education that you're like, I want to get out of it. So my thing was, I was so unhappy with working 12 hour shifts, missing out with my kids growing out, growing up that I was completely dead obsessed about making sure that I grow this thing. So I committed five years of my life. So I told my wife, I want to do this. And uh, in fact, my wife and I were starting a podcast that we're recording. The, we just recorded our first four episodes and the fifth one is this week and we're releasing everything next week and being a big launch podcast called uh, Next Door Neighbors. And the first two episodes, we talk about how she started her business and how I started my YouTube business and the advice that I give. But the obsession, she has to be so obsessed about getting this thing off the ground that when I told my wife this five years, if in five years this doesn't work, I had to give it 120%. That way I have no regret. I just gave it the old college try. I gave it everything. I invested money. So she has to obsess about it. She has to be so obsessed about it that she has to give herself an unrealistic schedule where she's going to say, I'm going to make four videos a week, one a week, every Friday. And then obviously that turns into three videos and not four because it's so hard to really keep up with the demand. So obsession, number one. Uh, number two, vlogs are very difficult. Vlogs, I think, really only work uh, either in the very beginning infancy stages before they even hit the market, which they've already done and the market's saturated. But vlogs, I think, only work now if you already have an established fan base, if you have an established 10,000 people who are committed to following you. So with her, the biggest piece of advice I would give her, apart from obsession, is she has to create content that is value given. So she has to take, kind of forget about like, I, I want to be a, an influencer or a vlogger or whatever YouTuber, but say, I want to find out what is these bits of information that I want to give away free to this world. And then after that, she has to figure out how to present it in a way that is so quick that like, for example, when I started shooting YouTube videos, uh, audience retention is important because of the YouTube algorithm says, Hey, you made a 10 minute video, but any, no, everybody clicked out of it in the first minute and a half. Then YouTube goes, well, that's, that's not good content. We're not going to promote it. When you win, YouTube wins. So I shorten it up to six minute videos. And if I can take a 30 minute video and jam pack it into a quick six minute video and get all the stuff out there, the person watching it gets kind of sucked in and they go, okay, great. Good audience retention. So 
have her condense, start with smaller videos, shorter duration, straight to the point, fast paced, put it out, do it for a long enough period of time that our audience base starts growing because they're seeing value given from that. And then from that point on, when she gets that first group of people who are so engaging and so looking forward to the next piece of content, then she could say, oh, okay, you guys want to see more of me? Let's do vlog style. This is me and Josh. Josh has this. This is my own personal life. But you can't go into vlog because nobody knows who you are yet. And YouTube is just going to go, not important, not going to promote it. That's really good. Thank you. I, 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 her birthday Sunday, I guess I don't have to get her a gift now. No, no, just cut this clip and give it. To her. <laughs> hey babe, sit down. I have something to show you on the TV. And then like after a minute and a half, my rant is over and you look at her and be like, you're welcome. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> so, um, back to jujitsu. I have a yep. few minutes left. Yep. yep. Just, just in this thought process, you, how tall are you? 6'2". So you're a big, strong guy. You and I are going to roll. What are you submitting me with? <laughs> I don't even know because you black belts are another world. Like you, I, I, man, every time my professor says, hey, you come roll with me, it's just like a humbling experience because everything that I've drilled, everything that I tried, whether we just went from ankle locks to anacondas to all this stuff to now I'm like, my body is a piece of plywood and you guys just are twirling me on your elbows and your knees across the entire platform. Um, but if the question is what's my go-to as a, a young blue belt, um, I like to start out with a spider guard, uh, maybe a collar sleeve. Uh, hopefully from there, I play a little deli Hiva. Uh, if, if, if you've had a little too many margaritas and you're feeling a little too loose, I hope I catch you in a sweep <laughs> and then maybe catch you in an Ezekiel after getting a mount. But that's, that's my, that's my, like my, my, my approach, I guess. All right. I dig it, man. So right now, so I, it's, I actually all the way up through jujitsu, I played uh, spider collar sleeve. That was my whole position. Um, you know, I was really, really good at a, a few moves from that position, but that was what I played all of my competitive career, um, mm -hmm. all the way up until brown belt. Well, there's this new transition. It's new. It's innovative. It's awesome. I invented it. It's a uh -huh. new card. It's called Duck Guard. I've teased it on the show for the past six months. It's not totally developed yet. It's close. When it is developed and we film on Simplifying Jiu Jitsu, that's my production company, I'll send you a copy of it. And you will duck yeah. guard slash goose guard everybody yeah. on the planet. Yes. Oh, I'm excited, man. I'm so excited it's, about it. I'm this. telling you, it is really cool. It is a really cool guard. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie to you on this one. I, do you, uh, do you have a, any bit of spoiler to it or, or you want to keep it on the hush hush? So, so, um, I've done little spoilers. The big thing is it's an entire guard based off one grip. Okay. The guard, the grip is um, cross sleeve and in for the longest time it was you know, usually we call it far side cross sleeve because most people lead right leg right um, when they're trying to pass the guard and so we always called it that well up until this week and this is why because duck guard was pretty complete uh, but up until this week we uh i say we me <laughs> yeah we were just training and i developed something new uh that we one of my students named goose guard because I guess the transition just makes sense uh, for dealing with the right leg lead. So now it's amb an ambidextrous guard, but it's all based on one grip. And the idea is if you can get really good at that cross sleeve grip, then being in guard, especially since it's not something a lot of people play as of right now, um, being in guard is just a matter of getting to your one grip. And then you will have the 10 answers of all the different things that they might be able to do. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got a really strong ankle lock into it. it some people call it like the musa meshi lock and uh it's a way that mikey musa meshi does his straight ankle lock really really cool position but that's all i'll give you that's okay. all i'll give you okay. next time next time when it's done when it is yep. complete when yep. it's 90 percent complete and we film i'm mm -hmm. i'll send you a copy and you will you will wreck mm -hmm. boise idaho with it Whew. i'm excited hey where are you located by the way I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. Well, I'm on the board. I'm actually in. Oh, oh yeah. So, so yeah, kind of like what you mentioned in the story. That's your. I, I thought that's where you grew up, but you're 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 there still. Okay, cool. I'll have to make sure that if any of my travels we cross paths, I have to make sure 
to stop by over there and, and train with you. Hey, one thing I wanted to, I wanted to compliment you because you kept talking to me about, you know, what I'm doing. I really, it's really cool what you're doing with creating content that's being successful while integrating uh, jujitsu in it. Um, there's not a lot of people doing it. Uh, my, my professor is really knowledgeable in his craft, but I keep telling him, I was like, you really like, cause I'll see, I'll, I'll follow all these jujitsu accounts that like these short film videos that are high production value uh, that really are captivating. And just to see people who are doubling down on it is incredible because if there is, I don't know if you know, so do you have a, you have a very strong uh, Instagram presence I saw. Do you have a, a good presence on Facebook? Um, not really, just no, Facebook no. friends. Okay. Well, um, uh, are you are you are you leveraging? Uh, or, well, what about YouTube? Are is that something that you are doubling down on, or or what's your presence on YouTube like? So for the longest time, I did nothing on YouTube, okay. and then I uh, um, I did a podcast with Huron Gracie, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to put this one up. I had a YouTube channel that I had never posted anything on. I actually used it for my gym announcements. I would put unlisted videos up and send them to everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, that was like the first time. And so pretty much all I do right now is uh, uploading to YouTube with the podcast. But starting like as soon as we get it finished, mm -hmm. um, we're going to start uh, the Why You Suck at Jujutsu show uh, mm -hmm. where we break down like five minute uh, really simple. We're start doing all submissions the first season of it. Uh, we're going to break down like uh, guillotine and try to give you something really, really something because guillotine is something so many people struggle to finish, right? Um, and everybody goes in to finish that guillotine and they all struggle to finish it, right? And uh, just explaining why that is. It, it, it was going to be called Focus on the Why, um, but we just decided for, or I just decided for branding, like that why you suck at jujitsu made more sense. Oh yeah, that's great. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, that will be the first time we do anything on YouTube though. Yeah. So here's one piece of advice I want to give to you because we already got, we, we already got a gift for your wife. So she's <laughs> already got one. She's, she's, uh, I wanted, I, I wanted to pass on a little bit of insider information for you. Not like Martha Stewart stuff where you're going to do some jail time, but like just, enough okay, thank God. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, a, a lot of my, uh, content creator buddies who are way above me, passed on a little tidbit that as of recently, Facebook started monetizing short form content, content that sounds like the most golden duration is in that four minute mark. Um, and it's able to be, uh, they started putting advertisements or ads on it on Facebook. So Facebook has its own little hidden tab that you have to kind of almost Google it to find how to get to it, but it's called Facebook content creators. Same way that YouTube has content creators. And by you creating, which looks like they like to see that one by one uh, ratio video with a really excellent thumbnail and really fast paced and just captivating uh, edits where if you can present that content in about four minutes, they'll put advertisements on it and you can make equal amount of money that you would be making on YouTube. So I've kind of done this example. I only started doing this in June. So I've been comparing the last three months uh, June, July, August. And in terms of income, as soon as you have a library of at least 10 videos already uploaded on it, you start seeing a, a pretty significant return on your investment in these advertisement placements. So as somebody like yourself, who is young in the game in terms of your age wise, and you're creating these, this content all around, just doubling down Gary V style, um, I think that would be an excellent form of uh, just four minute short term content uh, to upload to. And I think you'll see some good return on investment on that. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank yeah. you. It's not even my birthday. No. Oh, right. All right. It's uh. well, let me see. I'm looking at the calendar. Uh, first of Moraham begins on sundown. That's the 19th. That was yesterday. So <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> happy Moraham, bro. So, so um, we're out of time. We always finish with the same question. Okay. Yeah. So I usually pose it as I am um, at a seminar of yours, but maybe at Blue Belt, maybe you're not teaching seminars right now, but let's say <laughs> I am a brand new white belt, first day, and uh, we get paired together, and I'm sure that you treat white belts with no respect, you spit on them, you know, tell them yeah. you're their trash, you let them know, 
Uh, maybe yeah. the white belt's your wife, you know, yeah. so maybe you're really oh, <laughs> really digging in. Really, we try to make as many domestic abuse jokes. Yeah. <laughs> podcast. No, so we really try to, you know, so uh, your wife asks you, man, mm -hmm. I suck. I don't, I don't know. I suck at this. How do I suck less at jujitsu? What's your answer? Do I, do I want to get her into trouble or do I want to give her a good piece of advice? Give me both. Oh, okay. So, so, so let's, let's give her, let's give her like, okay, I, I want her to suffer a little bit. What I would tell her is be stiff as a board and create as much space as possible. And most importantly, leave your hands out as much as you can. What you would never want to do is bring them in. That's what I would tell her. Muscle everything. Muscle everything. Yes. And lead. Yeah. Yeah. Lead. It's like, I tell people how to lift something. I was like, what you want to do is lock your back out and your knees and lead with your neck. Uh-huh. Take your legs completely yeah. out of the equation. Yeah. Yep. Quick, quick as smooth and uh, <laughs> smooth as fast. Okay. Exactly. Um, as far as good and I, as far as, as uh, you know, a, a, a beginner blue belt, good piece of advice. I would give a white belt how to suck less. Um, Let's see here. I think my go-to is always what I've been told is to relax and breathe, but I don't think I knew what that meant in the very beginning stages of that. Um, I would say, actually, I would say on this, I would say what I remember Hicks and Gracie saying, uh, he had a little talk about the invisible jujitsu, and I would say it's fine places to rest, right? So um, it was almost impossible for me to do in no gi because I don't know what I'm doing, but in gi, grab something, get on your side and catch a few breaths, I guess, <laughs> and uh -huh. then I just find that invisible jujitsu. That is excellent advice. That is excellent advice, man. That is, uh, uh, that's perfect. Thank you so much for being on the oh, show. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate yes. it. Yes. Is there anything you want to say to finish? Uh, I, you know, I mean, thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, it's, it's awesome. You seem like an awesome, uh, instructor. Um, uh, you can always tell a person's humility by the conversations you have with them. And uh, I think your students are really lucky to have you, man. I'm a good actor. <laughs> it's awesome. And that is the episode. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, so, so cool getting to talk to Alex. He's such a nice guy. And uh, almost, I think pretty much everybody we've ever had on the show is a pretty cool person. And uh, it was nice to get to talk to somebody different, you know, almost uh, you know, we've had a few people that were non-black belts on the show, but very few. Um, you know, we had Kristen Beatty when we talked about mental health, and uh, she was a blue belt at the time. You know, we had, you know, we've had a few others, but you know, it's mainly black belts. And I love getting that change of pace. Somebody who is incredibly interesting, but maybe isn't a black belt yet in jujitsu. And so that was really cool. It was really fun to, to dig in. And I know for a lot of people, um, like when I interviewed Kristen, that was a lot of people's favorite episode because it's different when you get somebody on and like Alex did immediately on the, the show and we start talking about Jiu Jitsu, you know, asks questions to me instead of me just asking questions to them because sometimes uh, as a black belt, I don't have the right questions for another black belt, the questions that maybe you, it's a white, a blue, a purple belt may have for them. So that was what I really loved doing. And uh, I got some really great advice when it came to the podcast. And uh, I was really excited about that. I honestly, those are some things like I wanted to ask at the very end, but I don't know. I didn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't know um, kind of if that was all right to ask him, you know, just about, about YouTube and social media and things like that. But he was just so cool, so uh, willing to just give advice to me and to you guys um, that may have ideas uh, or hopes of being, uh, I guess, influencers or something like that on social media. I thought it was just so cool that he just went out of his way to give that kind of advice. And uh, so I really, really enjoyed that episode. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Uh, as far as things go right now, we're going to keep our uh, bi-monthly uh, interviews on, on the show. And I really have found that uh, people like that. They like, some people like interviews, some people like the solo cast, but it seems like most people like the combination. They like to do both. And I like to do both. As I told you guys before, it's very hard to do these uh uh, to do too many interviews, uh, to, to do them back to back and stuff, because 
I don't get to research. I don't get to ask enough stuff to the person uh, that, that I'm interviewing. And I feel like that causes uh, the interviews to not be as great. And I like kind of slowing them down, doing more solo casts, doing more question and answer episodes and doing two interviews uh, a month. And then when I do two interviews a month, I can get really cool people like Alex or, uh, oh, I almost told you guys who I was gonna try to interview next. I haven't recorded it yet. So I never tell you guys until it's recorded because I think I've done that like earlier on the show and I ended up not getting this person on for like a very long period of time. And then everyone was like, oh, you're a liar, Josh. We hate you, you suck. We're gonna come to your house and kill you. You know, all kinds of stuff like that. You wouldn't believe the death threats that I get from the things that I say on the show. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't think I've ever gotten any of those. Uh, sometimes I'll tell stories about my wife on the show and then I'll get death threats from, from my wife. But uh, that, that's pretty much it. That's usually all the death threats I get. And she hasn't killed me once yet. So I think things are fine. But that is what I have for you guys today. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Uh, if you guys have any ideas, any thoughts on people you would like to hear me interview or uh, any topics for any of the solo cast episodes, I would love to hear about them. You guys can uh, send me a message on Instagram at the Josh McKinney. You can message me on Facebook and you can send me an email, josh at simplifyingjujutsu.com. I hope that you guys have a great rest of your week and I hope that you guys suck just a little bit less at jujutsu.